Um, hello, my name is Philip Roberts. Um, I work with the University of York and with the National Media Museum. And for a couple of years, I've been looking at the um, instrument trade. Is there something going on with the projector? I can see something. Now, I'm interested in how the business of This was really common in the 19th century as well. <laughs> Thank you. OK, I'm, I'm interested in how the trade itself developed over the 19th century, in particular in the manufacture side. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about makers. Um, and I've been working recently from two main premises in my work. Um, I'm, I'll state them first, and then we'll come back to them later. The first is that for the people who were making magic lanterns, particularly at the start of the 19th century and into the 18th century, there is no distinction at all between scientific practice and media practice. Okay? All of the early magic lantern manufacturers were instrument manufacturers. They were making microscopes and telescopes and things like this. They could grind lenses, so they would use this in any way that they could to make a sack load of cash. This is their main aim. They're not interested necessarily in pushing science in the way that the scientists were. Um, the second premise of my work is that lanterns and instruments themselves imply a broader field of practice. Okay? In order to keep a lantern manufacturing business on the road, you need to make lanterns. Okay? Normally, you're not going to be in a position to make tin, brass, wood, glass in, in lots of instances. So you've got to be attached to a much bigger field of practice, which is tinsmiths and brass founders and artists and painters and printers and all of these people who will keep your business moving. Okay? If you're a magic lantern manufacturer, you might be very, very good at grinding lenses, but you probably don't know how to roll tin. So you've got to be connected to other things in order to keep the business going. Okay? So my work has been looking at these these two premises and trying to tease out how the industry develops from here, okay? Um, these are two really, really early um, trade cards. They're from the start of the 18th century. Some people in here will probably be able to give me the dates. Um, they are for John Bennett and Nathaniel Hill, and they both, if you look very closely, have magic lanterns in them. One there and one there. And they're in the camera obscura. Um, the very particular kinds of early magic lanterns, which we perhaps talk about in the question and answers. But Instrument makers were already specializing in non-scientific things um, as early as the start of the 18th century. Okay, I'm going to talk about the person I always talk about, which is Philip Carpenter. Um, he is my best friend in the 19th century. Um, and Carpenter is important because his case really exemplifies the expansion of lantern manufacture and media manufacture more broadly at the start of the 19th century. So he's working in the 1810s and the 1820s, and then he dies in 1833, and his business goes on to become Carpenter and Wesley, one of the biggest lantern and slide manufacturers of the century. Um, Carpenter was a Birmingham, a Birmingham optician. He starts working in 1808 when he inherits his uncle William Carpenter's optician's business. Um, he's a Unitarian, which is very, very important. It means that he's supported by the Unitarian community in Birmingham, and this explains how he's able to get into a position to start manufacturing um, instruments en masse. Um, in the 1810s, in, 18, in 1817, rather, he is chosen by um, David Brewster as the manufacturer of the kaleidoscope, which is what this is here. This is the most important object in the Media Museum collection. Um, this is an 1817 Carpenter-made telescopic kaleidoscope. It is the first kaleidoscope that was manufactured. It is the first media craze in the entire of media history. And what happens with the kaleidoscope is Brewster is able to apply all kinds of optical principles to create this handy little neat toy, and they were able to manufacture a lot of them, and people bought a lot of them, and it became very, very popular. Um, but it didn't become popular by magic. Um, I've read a lot of articles on kaleidoscopes, and I've been referred to um, by numerous polite peer reviewers to lots of articles that talk about how the kaleidoscope um, was an important part of culture. 
but there's a big difference between knowing the kaleidoscope exists and understanding why the kaleidoscope was able to do what it did. Almost no one has talked about the manufacture of the kaleidoscopes, which is really, really, really interesting if you look closely at them. So because they are very simple pieces of kits, you can take them apart and look really closely at what they're made of. So the kaleidoscope, very simply, is two slightly uneven sized brass tubes, some little brass fixings to hold them together, some mirrors, a bit of wood glued in, and these ends here. Now the ends are wonderful because they're stamped brass and they're stamped in the same way that buttons were stamped at the start of the 19th century. Um, this just means that you soften a bit of brass, you get your stamper, you press it right in there, and you've got a nice design. Now this is great because this is exactly the same way that the button industry in Birmingham made buttons. They made buttons for a hundred years prior to Carpenter coming in and saying, can you make me some buttony things please to go on the end of me kaleidoscopes? And they did. Because um, he has no way of making buttons himself. He has no way of making brass himself. So he goes to a brass founder. Literally round the corner from Carpenter's shop in Birmingham, there is a man who specializes in brass tubes for telescopes and microscopes and things like that. He advertises himself as it. Um, the kaleidoscope reveals that all of Carpenter's work and all of, all of the instrument manufacturer's work is connected to this broader industrial workshop history that's taking place in Birmingham and in other cities around the world, in, in London and Nuremberg and in Sheffield. Okay? This is inserting the instruments that we have that we can hold in our hand into a broader industrial history. Okay? We'll come back to this again, but because of this and because the workshop industry in Birmingham is so efficient by the start of the 19th century because they can start to produce things in such big numbers because of the Industrial Revolution, you can make kaleidoscopes in far greater numbers than you could ever make. And suddenly, you have the capacity to create a media craze, to sell to the middle classes who are getting more money than ever before. All these economic and industrial things produce the kaleidoscope craze. Okay? Carpenter, this is, sorry, this is a slightly later one in the Science Museum collection that just shows that it was packaged very, very nicely so you could sell it as a desirable consumer object for the first time. Um, it's a lovely little thing. We'll come back to this. He repeated the same trick again for his Magic Lanterns in 1821. He started selling the improved Phantasmagoria Lantern, which is this wonderful thing here. This is a Carpenter and Wesley one from later in the century with... Um, all kinds of microscope attachments. He sold them with these slides here, the very famous elements of zoology slides. You probably have seen them before. And he did more or less the same thing. He would contract tinsmiths to roll them out a nice tin body. He'd get a Japaner to Japan the things. And he put in the optics, and he would sell it on and make a load of money in the process. Now, in order to do this, in order to really exploit the new kind of production capacities that you, could, um, that you could exploit in the 1810s and the 1820s, he'd have to market um, these instruments in a very, very clever way. Now, we talked about this a little bit this morning in our very first paper, that there's a kind of slippage between science and entertainment that happens here. This is one of my key premises, in that he has to present these things, magic lanterns, toys, in a strict scientific -y way to make it sound really valuable and wonderful and everyone will think that they can be science educators. But he's also got to keep it fun. He's also got to manufacture this in a way that, and sell it in such a way that people will actually want to buy these things. So, sorry, I've got quotes on here that I couldn't be bothered to copy out. So what he does is he sells books alongside these things. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. That explain all of the wonderful scientific education-y things that you can get out of a magic lantern. And he says, you can teach all of your kids about the classification of animals according to Linnaeus. And you can learn all these things about astronomy and all of the things that we've been talking about all day. But if you read it really, really, really closely, by which I mean, if you just read it, um, you start to glimpse that it's not as science-y as it sounds. So he talks about the condor, which is that guy in the middle there. And he says, 
that it's the biggest bird with the exception of the ostrich, which is fair, that's true. Um, and when full grown, it sometimes measures 16 feet and it's capable of snatching a small boy of 10 years of age and upwards. The fullness of its plumage, <laughs> the fullness of its plumage, mind you, is such as to resist a ball fired from a gun. Um, and similarly for the tortoise, guy up there, really nice, we can learn about tortoises. He says that the genus is divided into three assortments, land tortoises and river tortoises and sea tortoises, or turtles, and they feed upon worms, and they're long-lived. One in the gardens of Lambeth attained the age of 120 years, and they're so tenacious of life that one lived six months after its brain was taken out. <laughs> So you see this kind of slippage between hard scientific education and something that we can sell to excitable amateurs who aren't really scientists but would like to be part of this whole scientific education that's happening in the 1820s and 1830s and so forth. In 1826, Carpenter leaves Birmingham and he moves to Regent Street round the corner. Um, the shop is not really there. It's now like a covered tunnelway, um, but you can, you, can, you can go there and you can stand in the place where the stuff probably was. Um, and he did a very, very interesting thing. So moving from Birmingham, which is one of the manufacturing capitals of the UK, he already used this context very, very much, he moved to one of the entertainment capitals of the UK and discovered a different kind of context. He discovered that people were coming into his shop after going to all of these societies and entertainment places that we've talked about today. So he branded his shop as the microcosm or the grand microcosm of nature or something like that. If you look, this is a very, very small microscope. It's about that big. If you look in the box printed, it says microcosm carpenter. Um, this is interesting because he decided to rebrand his entire shop as a solar microscope thing. Um, he opened the microcosm, which is an exhibition of microscopic views that were projected in one of the rooms of his shop in order to pull people off the street, um, in order to convince them to come and buy things in his shop. Uh, and you would go in and you would see all of these microscopic details and you'd marvel at the flies and things and you'd have a great time and you'd think, I'd like to take some of that home and maybe buy a microscope or something, or maybe a magic lantern. This is interesting because it's part of the whole landscape of the area. So we've got, round the corner, the Polytechnic Institution is up the road from Carpenter's shop. You've got the Adelaide Galleries around the corner. You've got the uh, Lowther Arcade, I think, there. You've got the, we've got it blanked on it now. The Royal Institution is not quite what I was going for because it's a little bit more kind of science-y. No, there is a place whose name I have forgotten, the, um, there, that was projecting, it was showing like peep shows and things. Um, Again, down the road on Regent Street. It doesn't matter because I've forgotten its name. Um, but thanks. So we can all name these places. And he was making himself a part of this landscape. He was diversifying as an optician, as a pure science guy who was making microscopes and all of these things and spectacles and grinding lenses. He was becoming part of a broader entertainment landscape. And then interesting things start to happen. These are, two, um, these are two showbills from the Science Museum. The first one, this guy, just, he was showing optical views and a living picture of, picture of Regent Street. This is a kind of camera obscura. It, in his shop later on, on the second one, he's getting phantoscopias and cosmoramas. The cosmorama was the word I was looking for, by the way. Thanks. Um, and all kinds of completely non sciencey things, completely non-microscopic show things, just to be part of this landscape, because he was making money off this. Actually, well, I'll say he, this one, he's dead by the time this show bill comes out, but the business is carrying on without him. Now, this is interesting, because Carpenter is a really good case of someone starting off as an instrument maker and then diversifying into entertainment because there is no division between entertainment and science in this era. He's doing what he can to make money. But, and this is the problem with my own work, um, Carpenter is a hyper, hyper visible case. He is present in loads of sources. I know because I've found loads of sources on him where other people are not. Carpenter is working in a broader 
manufacturing and a broader retail landscape. Now, these are loads of lanterns. You've seen the first one before. That's the only carpenter-made Phantasmagoria lantern that I can think of or that I've seen, certainly. Um, and these are loads of other ones that I've seen that are mostly nameless. So we have, I'll shout, very, very early bullseye lantern in the same kind of phantasmagoria style as all the rest of them. What all these lanterns show, um, I think it's very, very unlikely that Carpenter invented a new thing and all these people copied him. It's much, much more likely that he is working within a whole network of practitioners who are kind of copying ideas and stealing things all over the place. It's um, It shows that there are people working around Carpenter, and I don't know who almost any of, of these people are. We can connect Carpenter to all kinds of people. This is a slide which, which I own, which is stamped Cox. If you look here. Now, Cox is one of about six possible Coxes. Um, I don't know which one, um, but I know they were there, and I know that they were buying slides off Carpenter, stamping it themselves, and selling it on. I know that Carpenter was also selling to, bear with me, I know that he was also selling to John Bywater in Liverpool and Edward Bird in Bristol, to Joseph Whiteman and N.B. Chamberlain in Boston, um, both of which have got catalogues that mention Carpenter's stuff. I know that, if you look here, I know that very, very similar slide sets, these are all astronomy ones, were being made by different people. Um, these are unmistakably the same image. This is the Carpenter. using identical images. The sets are exactly the same. Again, it's possible that Carpenter created the, um, the astronomy series and everyone else copied him. It's also possible that it came from somewhere else and I don't know where that place is. Similarly, projection microscopes. There are at least two other projection microscopes happening in London in the 1830s and 1840s. There are loads of newspaper reports that talk about these two, particularly the, um, the, uh, the Holland and Joyce one that mention Carpenter as well, that often say Carpenter invented the solar microscope or something stupid like that. Um, there are also, to go back, which should have been at the end, there are also 17 other people making, don't worry about it, making kaleidoscopes, because one year after Carpenter starts making the kaleidoscope as soul maker, um, all of these other people start making them. He couldn't fulfill the orders because it was so popular, so Brewster transferred in all of these different people, and some of them I've heard of. So we've got the Dolans, we've got Bait and Thomas Harrison's son and Banks, Egerton Smith, William and Thomas Gilbert, Burge, people I've never heard of, like Schmalkalder, no idea who that is, um, John Ruthven of Edinburgh. Um, all these people started making kaleidoscopes as well. And I have literally no idea how they did it, whether they matched the same as carpenters, whether they were similar, whether they were integrated into their own kinds of manufacturing things. I'm really curious about the Edinburgh one um, to see what kind of manufacturing processes were used. Now, some of these people, like Charles Blunt, also made Phantasmagoria lanterns in exactly the same way as Carpenter and sold them in exactly the same way because I've seen the catalogs. Um, now, I think that all of this shows that Carpenter is working in a landscape of manufacturers of which there is a handful of people that are sort of light up the history of this. So Carpenter and Newton and W.C. Huge and York and Son and people like that, the very famous ones. 
But there are other people. There's an optician around the corner from Carpenter's shop called Rothergill, who I have literally never heard of. He's not in any of the directories, but he is in the, um, the 1826 trade directory that shows he's there. Now, I don't know who he is, but I want to because I want to understand more about what the trade is doing, the whole broad accumulation of people and what practices they're stealing from each other that will reveal somehow whether Carpenter is exceptional or whether he's typical, whether he's doing something unique and inventive, as he always claimed, or whether he's just another practitioner that's stealing the ideas of everybody else and everyone else is stealing the ideas of him and so on and so forth. Um, now, I've about run out of time, but I ha you know, I've got lots of ideas on how we can do this. Um, so I'll be curious to hear what people have to say about it, I guess. Okay, thanks. Thank you.